Good morning. I want to welcome you uh, this morning to our worship here with Northminster Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're in Tucson, Arizona. We're not sure exactly where you are, but we invite you to fill out that online welcome card. Let us know where it is that you're worshiping from this morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Pete Seifert, and I, along with uh, Pastor Andy Ross and our tech team and our music team, we all want to welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, hear this word uh, of reflection as we begin our worship today, taken from the first chapter of 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, as we worship together, we are invited to walk in fellowship in the light of Christ. Friends, let us begin our service with the words of Psalm 34, Taste and See. Will you join me? And I invite you to uh, out loud say these words as a litany of response. It's a wonderful way we can connect with one another. Pastor Pete will say the P or people response line. I'll say the L leader line. But let's lift our hearts. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, Come my, children. my children, listen, listen to me. me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Let us worship God. Gracious and holy God, we worship you. When we seek you, you find us. When we cry out to you, you've already heard our groans. Lord, when we just bring our lives before you, you are already there. God, we thank you for your presence and for your spirit. Come and inspire our hearts now in the act of worship. Lord, we gather in this sanctuary and in our homes across the miles. Lord, wherever we are, you know us. You know how we have stumbled. You know our stains how we have said and done things we should not have said or done, and Lord, how we have failed to act, how we have failed to speak up when we should have acted, spoken. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. 
cleanse us of our stains. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us so that our feet will be back on your path of righteous, holy, loving living. In your mercy, clean us up. Show us new steps and new ways that are of you, Jesus. It's in your love and grace, Jesus, that we relax and smile. and We know we are embraced. Lord, we love you. Receive our worship now as a gift of love from our hearts. Hear us, Lord, as we now say together out loud the prayer, Jesus, you taught your disciples to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Friends, I want to welcome you to worship. We're so uh, glad. It just blesses our hearts that you are clicking on on your screens or TVs, wherever you are in southern Arizona or beyond. Praise God. And my first big announcement is it rained. Hallelujah. If, if you're joining us in worship and you're not from around here, uh, we've had a long, dry summer. And it rained last night. And uh, for us Arizonans, it's just like the entire earth just sighed in relief. We have a little puppy who went out in the rain for the first time and she was just splashing in the puddles. Oh, hallelujah. And as we celebrate rain, we celebrate that God gives us life. God gives us what we need. And even beyond that, God gives us grace and mercy and hope that we don't deserve. We hope that our service today here at Northminster Tucson is a blessing and an encouragement for you. Please let us know you're with us uh, because we can't see you like we used to. Uh, there's a little chat communication card in the margins, and I'd love it if you go up there. It just takes a few seconds. Let us know that you're in worship with us today, and if you've got a prayer request on your heart or a praise that you're celebrating, uh, we'd love to just see how you're doing. We read and pray through those during the week. Thank you so much. Uh, I do have some other announcements. One of the biggest is that after much prayer and discussion, and then more prayer and more discussion, uh, we have decided to open up an in-person uh, outdoor service uh, starting on September 13th. It's going to be at 7 a.m. out in our spacious children's courtyard. And uh, we're excited that this can be an opportunity for those of you who are just hungry to get back with us. Uh, I encourage you to think about coming uh, or maybe not coming. If any of you have some health issues or concerns or have some health fragility, uh, I would encourage you to continue to worship with us online for the time being. We will continue our 8, 9, 30, and 11 o'clock online services uh, for those of you who aren't ready to come back. But uh, our outdoor service at 7 a.m. will have full protocols. We're going to ask you to wear a mask during uh, the service, and we're also asking you to register if you're planning to come. Uh, we're going to watch our capacity, how many can be there, and, uh, but it will be a service featuring the same sermon, the same scripture, same theme, and it'll be an expression of the heart. You can learn more about that on our website. We also have a, a how are you doing and are you coming to that survey question uh, that you can fill out. It will just take a few moments, but uh, we're excited to announce that. We're also offering a Next Steps class for any of you who would like to know about, you know, what are the basics of becoming a Christian, becoming baptized, um, becoming a disciple of Christ, or, and or a member of Northminster Church? For any of you ready to maybe take some next steps with us, our class is going to be on Sunday, September 20th, from 1.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. One class with an opportunity to join our church at the end of that uh, if you are so led and ready. Um, so if you're planning to come to that, please do so, but call us at the church, let us know you're coming. And on our website, npctucson.org live, you can see a number of resources and online groups, uh, studies that are forming. I do want to say that we have a couple of care groups that are going to be beginning soon, a grief care class and a divorce care. Both will be online and they'll be starting up in September, 13 weeks of resources and getting to know others uh, in that group. If you're interested in being a part of either one, please let us know and send us a note. We have found that the grief care and the divorce care groups uh, are just wonderful ways for people to heal and find strength in Christ with one another. Also, uh, Pastor Ken, Marshall Warden, and myself, we're starting up in mid-September on Wednesday nights a class called Knowing God. It's a class based on the classic book Knowing God by J.I. Packer. 
Uh, we're celebrating his life and work. And uh, the interesting thing on Wednesday nights, there'll be two tracks, an in-person uh, limited attendance class. We're going to watch our capacity, but also an online virtual class. So if you'd like to be a part of one or the other, please uh, email us and let us know. It's, it, I hope it'll be a wonderful opportunity to just get stronger in your faith and your outlook as a Christian, what you believe and how you're living that belief. And then just lastly, after our services this morning at 12.30 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, we're going to have once again a cyber cafe. It's a Christian fellowship that's Zoom-based. There's no work. <laughs> it's just a fun fellowship to say hi to one another, check in. Pastor Pete will be there. And uh, to be a part of that, you do need to send us that email. Let us know that you'd like to register for that. And lastly today, it's uh, with a bit of a teary eye, we are celebrating and thanking Amy Baum for her years of service as our head of school for our Northminster Christian School. Uh, Amy uh, stepped into leadership about five years ago when we were in key need, and she is now stepping away from her post uh, just in order to focus on her family and help online teach her own children and for them to have time together. But uh, today we're thanking Amy for her service, and I know she has a few words to share. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I don't I had all my emotions, I think, in the first one. We'll see how this one goes. Um, I'm so happy to be with my Northminster family again this morning, even if virtually. Um, and I have two items to talk about this morning. First, an update about Northminster Christian School. Um, every time I usually get up here, I have an update, and I want to update you on how things have been going for the past few months. I want to thank you for your love and prayers and support as if we have navigated the challenges of COVID at the school. We reopened on June 1st, and I'm pleased to say that things have been going relatively well, all things considered. We've been serving 45 children and their families with seven staff members. Our usual is 13 staff members and 75 children. So as you can see, our enrollment has taken a big hit since COVID. The protocols that we developed, including temperature checks, more thorough cleaning, new drop-off and pickup procedures, and smaller ratios, and more, have helped us to keep our staff and students as safe as we are able, knowing that there are still risks. We have been able to secure some funding from DES, and a new child care grant is in the works, so you can be praying that that comes through for our school to help fill this gap, as we have a gap in enrollment and capacity right now. We are praying that these help to float us through. On behalf of our staff, I really want to say thank you for everything. For, our me for many of our staff, this is their only source of income. Sorry, this is where it gets me. And being open has meant so much to their families. This doesn't mean that they don't have fears. They do. But please continue to pray for them and support our school. It is needed now more than ever. Through all of these challenges, I've seen the Lord at work more than ever in our Northminster family taking care of us, in the new family who felt scared to bring their child, but through the love of our teachers and our protocols, they have felt cared for, in the child who's comforted by their teacher when they fall down, in the child who celebrates a friend when they learn a new skill. Jesus is all around us, and his presence is always so tangible on our school campus. Second, I'm here to tell you in person or virtually <laughs> that I've stepped down from my position in light of coronavirus and the realities of having three young children, two who are school age. We made this difficult decision as a family. When I started working at Northminster in 2014, my son James was just two years old and my son Charles was an infant. When I took over as a director, I was pregnant with my daughter Gloria, who's now three and a half. My children have grown here, and my family will forever be impacted by the students, teachers, families, and Northminster Church community. You have all meant so much to us, and thank you will never be enough. It's been an absolute pleasure serving in this role for the last five years, and 
I have learned so much, been humbled, and grown so much from my time in this position. The work that is done to educate and love children and the love of Christ here is incredible, and I'm honored that I've been able to be a part of this great work. This ministry is one of the most important ministries that you have here, and I pray that you continue to support it and pray for it and pray for the teachers, students, and new interim director as they continue the great work. I just want to say a huge thank you to my Northminster family. You have been the hands and feet of Jesus for me and my family, and that will forever impact us. Thank you so very much. Amy, thank you. Your leadership has just been a blessing beyond description for just the lives that you have blessed, children, family, our congregation. Uh, you came to us when we were in a bit of a lurch, and now as you're leaving, uh, I, I celebrate how uh, you've, you've blessed us and well prepared us for how we're functioning now. And so thank you for your friendship, your commitment. We have asked uh, and invited Carla Koenig to step in as our interim head of school. Keep Carla and our school in your prayers. But please, friends, uh, I hope you're able to express your thanks to Amy as she and Austin and the kids take some time. Uh, a big family road trip sounds like an adventure. Uh, keep them in your prayers uh, that God will continue to guide and lead you in ways for his kingdom's call. Um, we have a gift for you. Pastor Pete has worked with you and our school leadership team in many ways. Uh, there's, some, there's a travel journal and some letters and cards and some travel cups filled with chocolate. We hope that that's an encouragement for you. But uh, know that you always have a home here and that we love you and your family and uh, we'll keep you in our hearts. Thank you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Amy Baum and her years of leadership. Uh, Lord, not just for the mechanical things of running a complicated school, but Lord, for the ways that Amy has cared for children, how she has uh, stood steadfast in days and nights when it was just so hard, uh, how she and her family have just warmly embraced us. God, we thank you for Amy's leadership. And Lord, as she steps into a new chapter with her family, watch over her, Austin, and the kids. Bless and keep them always in your care. God, we pray for Carla and our teachers and our children and families continuing each day here at our school. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are the one who binds us together in your bonds of forever grace. And so, Lord, bless us to be a blessing and especially bless and watch over Amy. Uh, we thank you for her, her leadership, her love, and all that she's offered to us. Jesus, in you we pray and rejoice. Amen. Hey kids, uh, it's Pastor Pete, and I just had a uh, moment I wanted to share with you, a little special message. I want to introduce you to my friend. My friend is a frog, and uh, not only is he a cool frog, can you see him there? Yeah, he's got a big smile, but he also makes a cool noise, right? If you take a stick and you rub his back, he tells you how happy he is. Isn't that cool? He's so fun. Want to hear him croak again? Oh, yeah, he's cool. So why do I have a frog with me today? Well, I wanted him to help me tell you a little bit about how God's love works. So often uh, when we think of God's command and God's uh, telling us how to live, we think that if we make a mistake that we're going to be in trouble. And instead of being happy, that we're going to make kind of croak noises. Like God's going to take his gavel like a judge, and he's going to say we're guilty. That we've done something wrong and we're guilty. And it would sound like this. I know that's terrible. We don't want to hit our frog friend on the head. 
It reminds me of like little bunny Fufu hopping through the forest, bopping him on the head. Oh, no, that's not how God works. God is not a judge like that. God is a righteous and good judge. And we have an advocate. The Bible says we have an advocate before God, our Father, and that is Jesus Christ, that he is righteous. And that even though we might sin and we might do things that are wrong, our sin doesn't stop God from still loving us. Jesus represents us because he is perfect and righteous. He says, you know what? They're okay because they love me. I love them. They are happy. That is so cool. So this is a frog. And I'll never forget something I learned as a kid. It's called an acronym. Can you say acronym? acronym. Yeah, acronym. There you go. Um, an acronym is a word that has letters in it that mean other words. Okay? So that's like frog, F-R-O-G, is an acronym for fully rely on God. That we can remember that no matter what's going on in our life, God is strong, we can trust him, that we can fully rely on God. Frog. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you that you can make us happy by your grace, by your word. Teach us to trust in Jesus, for he is our advocate. He represents us. He supports us. He helps us. We give you thanks. We pray in his name. Amen.
Julia, thank you so much. Gracious God, may this world know us by your love. Gracious God, just as you give us the rain that we need, the daily bread upon which we feed, just as you give us loved ones in our lives who bring us enrichment, Jesus, you are the one who gives us at the very core the love that saves us. Thank you. Thank you, God. Lord, we lift up to you our lives, our struggles, and our triumphs, because it's in and through you that we live and move. Lord, as we come to you in worship, we are mindful of those who are struggling and hurting in this world. Bring your peace, Jesus, and show us, even as we pray that, how we can be agents of your peace right where we live, with our neighbors, uh, those in our city, communities. Lord, show us how to act and speak in ways that shine your light. Lord, there are still many struggling from this virus. We continue to pray for those doing medical research. We continue to pray for those who are on the front lines of medical relief. Bless them, refresh them, guide their efforts, O oh Lord, for theirs is a sacred work. We pray for all of the other frontliners, Lord, who make every day run, the delivery people, the clerks, the helpers in stores, our civil servants, and Lord, those who serve in leadership office. Even though we're barraged with campaigns and slogans, Lord, we don't forget that there are many, many more who are quietly working and serving in our city offices, county offices, state and beyond. Bless our civil servants, Lord, that they would guide and act with justice and wisdom. Lord, bring your relief. It's been a tough year. We have seen your hand of blessings holding us together. Lord, we hear the laughter of children in our Northminster Christian School. We learn of the tireless work of your church here at Northminster, but also, Lord, in faraway places. Lord, you've given us roles to play. Help us, God, to live out those roles, to be obedient to you. God, not because we must, but because we can, because, Jesus, you've embraced us. We pray for justice for those struggling with racial tragedies and prejudice. Lord, continue to open our eyes and open our hearts that we can act and speak and do those things of love and truth that will bring healing to this world and to our communities. Lord, show us your way. Shine your light. And may it be a May your word and spirit be a light for our steps each day in grace to know you, to rejoice in you, and to live as your people. God, you are so good. We worship and praise you, Lord, along with all of these prayers of intercession given today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
uh, aren't going to collect an offering at this moment, there are many ways that we can give an offering of our lives uh, financially and through our time and talents and treasure. Uh, you can find information there on your screen on how to contribute financially to the work of Northminster Church. It's been an amazing uh, season of generosity, so thank you for supporting the various projects and uh, helping us to maintain the ministry together that God has called us to. Uh, so let us pray together uh, as we dedicate our lives and offerings to God. Holy God, we thank you and we praise you for even as we might not be able to collect our offering here in the sanctuary, God, you are at work collecting us together as your people. So, Lord, we give to you our lives. We give to you the offering out of uh, how it is that you have blessed us as a, uh, as a response as a obedience and an act of worship, Lord, for how you have made us and how you've called us to live in this world. So bless our lives of offering. Bless the offerings that they could be used in transformational work, Lord, that you are directing and empowering, and that together we with the whole world would know that Jesus Christ is our loving Lord and Savior. Amen. Continuing our uh, worship sermon series, The Context of God, this morning. And uh, we're continuing to think about how it is that God is changing our lenses of how it is that we see the world and act in the world. And we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2 this morning. And, and earlier at the beginning of the service, I read from uh, ver chapter 1, where it talks about how we were walking in the light of God, that God is light and that in God there is no darkness. And 
it follows through and discusses in that first chapter how that if we say that we don't have sin, then the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and righteous to forgive us that we can walk blameless in fellowship with him. So immediately after that, we hear these words from chapter 2. And he begins by saying, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that if we come to know him, if we keep his commands, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him, that whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Let us pray. Oh God, now as we hear your word read and heard it proclaimed through my words, God, will you teach us and come upon our hearts and our minds and our souls that we might live transformed lives, lives giving, given for you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this passage begins with John saying, my dear children, and in some translations it says little children. And it, you might think, well, okay, John, why are you writing to a group of adults and calling them little children? Well, it's a, it's a way of speaking, right? It's, it's a way of writing, uh, and it's, a, it's called the honoring diminutive, or the affectionate diminutive. And that's whereby you, you use a word or an ending of a word to kind of slightly change it, but you do it in an honoring way. So in Spanish, this works when you add ito on the end of something. So if you have a grandfather and your grandfather is honored, uh, you would call them abuelito. You're not saying that he's a little grandfather. You're saying that he's honored and, and loved, right? Same thing with young ones. You would say jóvenes normally, right, in Spanish, but, but you would say jovencitos to say my, my loved, dear, little, young people. Okay, so he's calling us children, not because we are like babies, but because we are dearly loved and honored. But if you, if you think about children, there are two things that are true. One, they are so adorable, and, and John is getting beyond, behind this, right? They are adorable and to be loved. But at the same time, Children are just so childish. There's so many things they haven't learned. I used to think when I was a kid that my dad was just kind of grown big, right? And that he had never been a child, right? Uh, but that's not how it works. We are children first, and we have to go through a process of learning. So while children are cute and they garner a lot of attention, they say, look at me, look at me. We quickly re realize, though, that children have a lot of lessons to learn. Take, for example, this young child who was coveting the container of Hershey's chocolate cocoa powder. He wanted it so bad, but because he can't read, he can't see the words natural, unsweetened, or powder that are on the package. I've got a video to show what happens. The child will not stop insisting on tasting this. I keep telling him it's going to be gross, but he does not want to listen. So I'm going to let him find out for himself. Spit it out. Come on, get to the sink. Yeah, you could just see it on his face. He, he thinks he's been lied to. He saw the package. It's chocolate. Why doesn't it taste like I expect it to be? Some people have seen that video and said that's kind of like 2020. We thought it was going to be so great. <coughs> Coughing out 
all kinds of brown things. Okay, we've been in quarantine too long. So at some point, this little child is going to learn to listen to his mom, hopefully. Heeding instructions from others, obedience, is not necessarily the strong suit of children or of teens or of young adults or of any age adults, really. Obedience is hard. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is how is it that we can live a life of obedience understanding that God is light and that we have the uh, command to follow God who is in light and to live as children of light. And so I want to talk about two types of obedience. The first type of obedience is kind of like the way the world looks at obedience, and it's not the model that I want to uh, show you today, that I want you to keep with you. I want you to hold on to that second model. So the first one is what I would call religious obedience. And this is maintained, and uh, this is how a lot of religions work in the world, that you, re- you obey religiously, and by the product of that religious obedience, you work yourself to salvation or enlightenment or whatever it is. And we would understand this as works righteousness. But this is how a lot of things in life work. If we think about our lives physically, we know that if we want to have some, some kind of success, that we have to discipline ourselves. So if we want to lose weight or if we want to get stronger, we know that when it's early in the morning and the alarm goes off, that instead of following the feeling to stay in bed, we discipline, our, discipline ourselves to get up and, and maybe go exercise. Or if there's a full plate of cookies there, we see it, we might eat one cookie and then immediately want to eat the whole thing of cookies. We say, no, that's not good for me, so we discipline ourselves. This is the kind of obedience that we often uh, use or we, we employ in our lives. And if we obey and discipline ourselves to a certain degree that we can have success, it hurts when we fail, and it might also hurt when we succeed. It might be a temporary victory, but there's always going to be something else that is next, that we have to work towards. Now, a lot of people believe God this works this way, and a lot of Christians believe God works this way, that we have to follow in the Bible this list of rules, and in following this list of rules, then we would get salvation because then God will love us, and then we'll be okay, and we'll be acceptable. Except that's not the gospel. That is not what Christianity is about. We cannot obey our way to a relationship with God. So the second time of obedience that I want you really to grasp and and to uh, help marinate in your life is what I would call true Christian obedience. And this is in response to God's provision of salvation by grace. So salvation is by grace through faith, as we read elsewhere in the Bible, And when we understand this and have experienced this, God works in our lives by the Spirit to bring us into relationship with God. And because of this new relationship with God, that is not based on obedience, but by grace, because God's loved us and accepted us, then we obey God's command, his instructions, his word. God, after all, is the Savior, not people. So when it says in verse 1 that I read, dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin, this is not because that in not sinning we are able to save ourselves. No. Because in the next line it says, but if anybody does sin, or we could even understand it as saying, when you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, the whole cosmos. And this is where the centrality of the cross is so important, so critical. It is because of the cross of Jesus Christ where he dies as an atonement for sin that we have our sins removed from us. He bears 
the weight of sin. He bears the weight of death. And in the power of resurrection, defeats death so that we can live with him eternally. That's how we understand the gospel. So Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he is raised bodily, and he has ascended to heaven. And someday we will be reunited in that resurrection. This is the clearest form of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the message that has been entrusted to the church to share with the whole world. That it is by grace that we are saved. There's not a thing we can do, not a lick of obedience that we can do to save ourselves or to put ourselves in a right relationship with God. It's always in response to God's saving action. We see the same pattern in the Old Testament when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. It's important to realize that it's not just the Ten Commandments that are the most important part of the story. That is a response. God's giving them commands to obey because of what God has already done. And if the Ten Commandments are in Exodus chapter 20, then we want to look at Exodus chapter 19 to see what it is that God has done. And we're reminded there that it says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be treasured, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So that Israel, when they receive the Ten Commandments, they hear again, what is it that God has done to save them, to bring them out of slavery in Egypt, to redeem them from that lostness, to set them as a holy nation, that the Ten Commandments will help them be holy and set apart for God's purposes to be revealed through them. This is how the true God of love and grace operates. God graciously saves and requires obedience in return. We also hear of this requirement of God through the Old Testament prophet Micah in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. He has shown you his love, his mercy, how he has called you as a people. And what does the Lord require of you in response? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Martin Luther, the Reformation theologian, wrote it in Latin that we are simul justice et peccator. I didn't study Latin. We are simultaneously righteous and sinful. Simultaneously, we are righteous and sinful. And so, as Christians, we have to understand that when we make mistakes, we aren't just lost, but we have been found already. Yet, we are called to this life of obedience. Just because we have come to Christ does not mean that we will stop making mistakes. But it does mean that now, as we follow the Spirit of God, more and more we will experience transformation in our life, in our thinking, and in our acting. So I want to talk about four resources that God provides for us that we could live obediently to God. And the first one is truth. Truth is knowing the truth that makes us walk in the light of truth. So if God is light and in him there is no darkness, then we want to be people of truth. If there's good news out there, don't you want to hear it? Don't you want to share in that? Don't you want to walk in the light instead of stumbling around in the dark? Verse 3 and 4 says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, knows Jesus, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So it's so important for us to know Christ, to know him in a personal way and in a real way. And the way that we come to do that is through the revelation that God gives to us through his word. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and helps us to be in this new relationship. And when we discover the relational power of our salvation, then we are energized and excited to live in obedience. So the next resource is holiness. 
This is a kind of holiness or righteousness that doesn't come from ourselves. In the same way it was true in the Old Testament that God was going to give them holiness. God was going to put that on them. In the same way, it says that Jesus Christ is the righteous one. He is the one who is our advocate before God our Father. So that we are children of light with this advocate who makes us holy. The theological term for that that we learn in seminary is imputed righteousness. We have a righteousness that is not our own. We are sinful and stained. God removes our stains in Christ, gives us a new righteousness. It's imputed to us, given to us. The third resource for living obediently to God is love. Verse 5 at the beginning says, If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Some versions say that our love for God is made complete. Some versions say that God's love is truly made complete. I like them both. I like the idea of our love, my love for God increasing in me until it's complete and full. I also like the idea that it is God's love that is in me coming, becoming full. And so then it can be a part of a repeating pattern, a, re, a, a positive feedback loop by which we experience love and then we're more loving. And when we're more loving, more people experience love and we experience more love and it just grows and grows. And then the fourth resource to live obediently to God is freedom. Verse 5 at the second half and then verse 6 says, This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, in Christ, must live as Jesus did. This is an opportunity to respond in freedom. The word, whenever we hear the word must, we think, oh, that's obligation, that's something we have to do. Yeah, it's, it's something we have to do because of the amazing truth of where this sits. We couldn't do anything else. We're not under the threat of punishment, but instead we're invited into participation in the family business. So that obedience is like an apprenticeship, doing what Jesus did, learning from the master Jesus how we can become more like him. Personal freedom comes from the release of the burden that you are responsible for your own salvation and the salvation of others. You and I have freedom and permission to try new things and to live for God. We have permission to learn. We have permission to actually learn from our sin. Not that we would continue to walk in sin, but that we would realize our sin, uh, re repent of it, turn from it, to learn about ourselves through that process and grow more in Christ-likeness. And there are some times in our lives when our rebellion against God and God's law is clearer than at other times. And I think uh, one of the times that we have to understand our sin in our life is now. It's important for us to realize that we have sin currently that we are a part of. We have the freedom, though, to acknowledge our sin, to name it, and to approach God and ask for forgiveness, to repent of it, to walk in obedience. This freedom to confess sin starts now. Now I want to talk personally for a moment. As a pastor, as a Christian pastor, my experience has been that uh, I've tried to, in my life, not to sin. That's a good thing, right? Yet sometimes I sin. And I don't do so so intentionally, but usually unwittingly. And one sin that I've participated in unwittingly is with a whole lot of other Christians, and that is one of the sins of the American church. Churches in America have been segregated by race ever since the first African slaves or African Americans tried to become members of white churches and they were asked to leave. And they had to form their own separate churches, their own separate denominations. They had to meet separately. The positive to this is that the black church has been able to forge a strong identity at the center of their community. The negative is that the church in America has not modeled a witness to our nation of how to speak with credibility about race. 
while the white church, I don't believe, has been overtly racist, it has been intended to be silent, especially at times when our black brothers and sisters have experienced prejudice and pain. I'll never forget in 2012, I was in a small group of diverse pastors from various backgrounds, various uh, races, various uh, cultures. And the black pastors were describing what it was like at that time in 2012 to minister to their congregations in light of the death then of Trayvon Martin. Now since then, there have been many, many other African-American men who have been killed by white people, and it has been an experience in black communities that ruptures them and, and, and really is painful for them. Now, in my small group of pastors, the black pastors explained how they had to address it and talk about it and preach about it in their congregations, because everyone was talking about it. Everyone in the African-American community was hurt, and they needed to hear a word of healing from God's word in that. And in many times, these black pastors felt like they were holding their communities together because of all of the hurt and pain that they had experienced. And those of us in that group who were white, we kind of looked at each other and we, we confessed. And I continue to confess that we didn't talk about that with our churches. We didn't see or feel the pain of our black brothers and sisters, even though they are Christians with us. We are one church. We're not separated or segregated or divided. The dividing wall of hostility, the Bible says, has been torn down by the grace of Jesus Christ. So the sin that I want to confess is not the horrible, ugly sin of overt name-calling racism. No, it is the insidious, hidden, barely detectable sin of silence in the face of injustice. And this isn't a new phenomenon. It was something that Martin Luther King Jr. wrestled with as he wrote these words from a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama in April 1963. He wrote, First, I must confess that over the last few years I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards Freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering, bewildering than outright rejection. In spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances would get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand. But again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sideline and merely pious, mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I've watched as so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion 
which made a strange distinction between body and soul, the sacred and the secular. So here we are moving toward the exit of the 20th century with a religious community largely adjusted to the status quo, standing as a taillight behind other community agencies rather than as a headlight leading men to higher levels of justice. Our sins, though they are many, we trust that God's mercy is greater still. That we can come to a God in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our failings, in spite of our silence. And to know we have an advocate who loves us, who loves our brother, and who longs for us to be reconciled. Let us pray. Oh God, I thank you for the gift of your word and the way that you teach and convict us, that you invite us to come to you even with our sin. But you invite us to stop and to drop it at the cross so that you can remove it from us, so that we can move unhindered, in freedom, joyfully, knowing who we belong to. Not as sinless people, but as people who yearn and strive to sin less. So God, forgive us. Remind us of your love. Remind us that we are more loved than we can possibly imagine, and because of that, we can walk out of here with our heads high, knowing that you have called us to something greater than ourselves. We long to see that, Lord. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
friends, it's true you're more sinful than you realize. But it's also true that you are more loved than you can imagine. And because of that, grace from God overflows from the cross of Jesus Christ. His Spirit is moving, even moving to you now, that you could hear this good news and respond. We'd love to know if, it, if you have understood God to be moving in your life in this way, and if you've come to the knowledge of this truth today for the first time or in a new way, we'd love to know that. Please let us know on that online welcome card. We'd love to respond to you and encourage you. And to know that there is amazing hope. In spite of our lostness or having been lost or even being childish, there is an amazing hope in the love and grace of Jesus Christ. As you go into the world from this time of worship, may you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.